Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The book I am interpreting for you is the representative work, The Remains of the Day, by Kazuo Ishiguro, the winner of the 2017 Nobel Prize in Literature. Published in 1989, The Remains of the Day is Ishiguro's most significant work. The significance can be understood from three perspectives. From a literary standpoint, the book won the prestigious Booker Prize shortly after its publication propelling the relatively young Ishiguro to the ranks of international top-notch writers. In terms of sales, readers expressed their love for the book through monetary support, and in the UK alone, the book sold millions of copies in its debut year. From the perspective of popular culture, the work successfully adapted into a film, with Ishiguro himself serving as the screenwriter in 1993. The film garnered multiple Oscar nominations, further elevating the novel's recognition and reach. Compared to other Nobel laureates, Ishiguro is not prolific, having written only seven novels and one collection of short stories in over 30 years. His creative works can be divided into two phases based on themes. The first phase of his writing is closely tied to his life experiences. Ishiguro, a Japanese-born British citizen, immigrated to England at a young age, forming his impressions of Japan mainly through childhood memories and magazines sent by his grandfather each month. At the age of 25, he began writing novels, and his first two works, A Pale View of Hills and An Artist of the Floating World, depicted the vague, fragmented aspects of Japan in his mind. Starting with the third novel, The Remains of the Day, Ishiguro completely departed from Japanese themes and continually evolved and broke through literary genres. He pursued a form of international writing that transcends cultural and linguistic boundaries, hoping that his novels would hold meaning for people living in any cultural background. For example, The Remains of the Day tells the story of an English butler reflecting on his 30-year career during a six-day journey. Although the novel deals with a distinctly British theme of butlers, Ishiguro actually used the butler as a point of entry to discuss the issues that have preoccupied him throughout his life, time, memory and self-deception. Following the protagonist, the butler, we embark on a journey about time and memory, observing how Ishiguro makes a personalized story resonate with readers worldwide. The story begins in July 1956. The protagonist, Stevens, is the male butler of Darlington Hall, managing the estate efficiently and earning the trust of Lord Darlington. Lord Darlington, a prominent figure, frequently associates with state officials and nobility hosting several major international conferences at his estate that significantly impact the British and European political landscapes. However, due to a mistake, Lord Darlington is forced to sell his mansion. The details of Lord Darlington's serious error will be revealed later in the story. For now, we only need to know that the mansion was bought by an American businessman named Mr. Faraday. Faraday, a typical emerging American tycoon, practical and uninterested in maintaining the ostentatious aristocratic style of Lord Darlington, dismisses dozens of servants from the mansion, retaining only four people, including Stevens, to manage the estate. He hints that they should refrain from increasing the staff. In addition to the contrasting characters of the American businessman and the British aristocrat, Ishiguro's choice of timing is intriguing. July 1956 holds special significance for the British Empire, as it marks the outbreak of the far-reaching Suez Crisis. The Suez Canal connects the trade routes between Europe and Asia and serves as a crucial hub for the British Empire to connect with its colonies. In an attempt to gain control of the Suez Canal, Britain, France, and Israel jointly initiated a military operation against Egypt. Despite Britain winning the war, interference from the United States and the Soviet Union led to Egypt's political victory securing full sovereignty over the Suez Canal. Losing control of the Suez Canal also symbolized the formal dissolution of the British Empire. Ishiguro sets the beginning of the remains of the day at this juncture, subtly suggesting the intention that the British Empire is heading towards decline. Moreover, this timing casts a melancholic hue over the entire story from the outset, reflecting the fading glory of the empire. Returning to the novel, Despite Stevens rearranging the staff in the mansion, practical difficulties arose due to several management oversights. Stevens eventually realized that the household lacked a crucial figure, such as Miss Kenton, 
who had served as the housekeeper years ago. Just at this time, the new owner, Mr. Faraday, proposed lending a car to Stevens for a countryside vacation. Consequently, Stevens decided to visit Miss Kenton, reminisce, and invite her back to work, resolving the pressing issue of staff shortage in the mansion. Thus, the observations and diary entries during this journey became the main narrative thread of the novel, while another hidden thread was Stevens' poignant memories triggered during the trip. Over the thirty-plus years of his service at Lord Darlington's estate, spanning two world wars, Stevens witnessed the mansion's peak during its most glorious period, reflecting the pinnacle of his butler career. On the first day of his journey, Mr. Stevens, shortly after setting out, beheld a picturesque countryside scene. He wrote, What met my gaze was essentially vast stretches of fields, layer upon layer, extending endlessly to the horizon. Interestingly, this landscape triggered Mr. Stevens' contemplation of England's terrain. Our protagonists perceive this as the greatness of Great Britain, characterized by serene beauty and noble restraint. The exploration of the concept of greatness also unveils a pivotal theme in the novel, namely, the culture of butlers. Through Mr. Stevens' perspective, the author extensively delves into the standards of a great butler. In Mr. Stevens' eyes, achieving the status of a great butler constitutes the entire meaning of his life. So, what significance does the profession or image of a butler hold in traditional British society? The butler is the overall manager of the entire mansion, the highest authority over all male and female servants. The butler often possesses high professional qualifications, is well-versed in various etiquette, and organizes the daily affairs of the entire household efficiently. In addition, the butler must have extensive knowledge of fine dining, fine wines, cigars, and other upper-class social knowledge, often serving as the master's private secretary. A distinctive service in English butler service is ironing the newspaper for the master every day. This service reflects the perfect principle in the butler's spirit, removing the fresh ink from the newspaper during ironing, sterilizing it, ensuring that the master can read the newspaper without soiling his clothes. As a central figure in a noble estate, a male butler holds a high social status, even being called the gentleman among gentlemen, the noble among nobles. The novel Stevens is such a typical English butler. Stevens believes that true butlers only exist in England because extreme emotional self-control can only be achieved by the English. This view directly points to the similarity between the butler's character and the overall British national character. Stevens is reserved and silent, suppressing emotions to an extreme degree, a typical English butler's personality. Stevens also believes that the core of becoming a truly great butler lies in having dignity befitting the position. In his view, the older generation of butlers, represented by his father, was more concerned with the employer's aristocratic status, while their generation is more concerned with the employer's moral standing. Stevens believes that serving a great figure like Lord Darlington is equivalent to contributing to the progress of the world, a form of indirect patriotism. It's essential to note that these discussions about great butlers lay the groundwork for later events, and they are inherently related to Stevens' life choices in the subsequent narrative. As the journey unfolds, Stevens intermittently brings his memories back to the past, revisiting two peak moments in his career that occurred in the Darlington estate. These two significant events, taking place in the mansion, not only influenced Stevens' career and Lord Darlington's personal fate, but also indirectly shaped the political landscape of Britain and even the entire Europe between the two world wars. The first major event occurred in March 1923. Lord Darlington invited over 20 guests to the mansion, including high-ranking diplomats, distinguished clergy, retired military gentlemen, as well as writers and thinkers. They convened for an international conference aimed at helping post-World War I Germany secure equal international rights. After World War I, defeated Germany was forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles with the Allied powers, accepting severe sanctions in politics, economy, and military. Among the Allied powers, France was particularly resolute and demanded harsh punishment for Germany. This was partly due to France's significant sacrifices during World War I, and partly because France hoped to seize this opportunity to regain European dominance. 
Thus, among the guests, Lord Darlington attached the utmost importance to the French representative. Without the participation or approval of the French representative, it would be impossible to ease the relations between Germany and the Allied powers. Gathering so many dignitaries is no easy task, so why did Lord Darlington go to such great lengths to assist Germany? After all, on a personal level, Lord Darlington participated in World War I, fighting against the Germans, and there was no particular camaraderie between them. From a broader perspective, although each of the Allied powers had their own hidden agenda, sanctioning Germany was still the mainstream opinion. To answer this puzzle, we must delve into the character of Lord Darlington. According to Stevens' recollections in the novel, Lord Darlington was a typical English gentleman, and Stevens was proud to serve such a figure. As an hereditary aristocratic gentleman, Lord Darlington strictly adhered to the principles of a gentleman, naturally displaying generosity and kindness toward defeated enemies, embodying the spirit of a gentleman. Now, how does the fate of the protagonist, Stevens, intertwine with this conference? Let's rewind the clock to the spring of 1922. At that time, Stevens suddenly lost both the housekeeper and the underbutler, and their replacements were Miss Kenton and Stevens' father, Senior Stevens. Miss Kenton was a lively, fiery, and highly capable woman. Initially, she and Stevens clashed in their work, but they quickly became harmonious work partners and silently developed an intimate relationship of mutual dependence. Of course, the intensely reserved Stevens never openly acknowledged this emotional connection. Stevens' father was an experienced old butler, and although he was somewhat elderly, Stevens managed to convince the master to keep him. This decision, however, laid the groundwork for the tragedy that unfolded later. In March 1923, as the household was busy entertaining guests, Senior Stevens fell seriously ill and lay on his deathbed upstairs. To not disappoint the master's trust, Stevens had no choice but to let Miss Kenton accompany his father. In the end, he missed the chance to bid his father farewell. Even when he received news of his father's death, Stevens showed minimal grief. The only concern he had was asking the doctor who attended to his father to go downstairs and tend to the French representative among the guests. In the eyes of ordinary people, this seemed utterly cold-blooded. However, when Stevens reminisces about that night, besides sadness, what prevails is a tremendous sense of professional accomplishment. This also indirectly underscores his previous exploration of dignity. This scenario constitutes irony regarding the English penchant for etiquette, vanity, and emotional restraint bordering on the abnormal. If the 1923 International Conference was a turning point in Stephen's career, testing his familial views, then the secret meeting between the leaders of England and Germany in 1936 can be seen as the further elevation of his career. In this instance, Stevens faced a conflict between his profession and love. That evening, Lord Darlington arranged for the Nazi German ambassador and the British Prime Minister to secretly meet at the estate. With the Nazis in power, Hitler's ambitions were no secret, yet Lord Darlington remained wholeheartedly committed to fostering friendship between England and Germany even facilitating a visit by the English king to Germany for talks with Hitler. He believed he was upholding justice in the world but unknowingly became a tool aiding the Nazis. To prevent this meeting, someone rushed to dissuade Lord Darlington overnight, warning Stevens, Lordship is a noble and good man. But the fact is, he's out of his depth now. He's being manipulated like a pawn by the Nazis. However, these words had no effect on Stevens, and he wholeheartedly devoted himself to serving in this secret meeting. His blind loyalty and trust in Lord Darlington prevented him from realizing the dramatic changes happening around him. Even more tragically, that night when Miss Kenton came to inform him that she had accepted someone else's proposal and would soon be marrying and moving away, Stevens showed no reaction, offering only congratulations. In fact, Miss Kenton deliberately shared this news with him and discussed her future plans to stimulate Stevens, hoping he would try to retain her. However, after expressing congratulations, Stevens immediately went back to work. So, was Stevens truly indifferent to Miss Kenton's news? The novel provides a poignant detail. When Stevens was tasked to fetch wine from the cellar and pass by Miss Kenton's door, he was very certain that she was crying inside. 
He stood at the door for a short moment, but this scene etched deeply into his memory, unforgettable. Compared to the previous time, this agonizing night strengthened the sense of achievement in Stephen's heart, considering his significant sacrifice as the pinnacle of his career. He felt proud of his performance during his father's final moments and believed that, in facing Miss Kenton, his choices were the correct ones, once again perfectly embodying what he referred to as dignity. The six-day journey finally came to an end. After nearly twenty years, Mr. Stevens and Miss Kenton met again. Strong emotions surged within them, but only subdued conversation was displayed. Throughout the journey, Mr. Stevens recalled Miss Kenton's letters multiple times, detecting a tone of despair between the lines. She mentioned her numerous attempts to leave home after marriage. In Mr. Stevens' eyes, Miss Kenton's plight was distressing. However, reality seemed to differ from Mr. Stevens' imagination. Miss Kenton stated that she had gradually fallen in love with her husband and had contemplated a life with Mr. Stevens. Yet time could not be reversed. As she put it, one cannot linger on in the possible and neglect the probable. After hearing this heartfelt revelation, Mr. Stevens finally erupted with immense and genuine personal emotions. It was the only instance of emotional expression throughout the novel when he said, Why should I hide? At that moment, my heart was breaking. Author Kazuo Ishiguro mentioned that initially, he wanted Mr. Stevens to maintain his emotional defenses, hiding behind them to avoid both himself and the readers until the end of the novel. However, he later realized that he had to let Mr. Stevens, near the conclusion of the novel, tear open a crack in his armor, and it was through this crack that readers glimpsed the protagonist's true inner self. In the final section of the novel, Mr. Stevens converses with a passerby on the pier. He states, For most of us, there is only the unattended moment in the dark. The evening is the best part of the day. Dusk marks the end of the day, also symbolizing the imminent end of Mr. Stevens' life. At this point, Mr. Stevens has soberly come to realize that he has squandered his entire life for a career. In the end, the secret meeting between the leaders of England and Germany was exposed. Lord Darlington fell from grace and died by suicide. The cornerstone of Mr. Stevens' life belief collapsed, and he discovered that the career he had devoted his life to was nothing but a castle in the air. The conclusion presented to readers is one of desolation, cruelty, and irony. Here, Mr. Stevens' life journey unfolds completely before us. It's important to note that although the entire story is narrated and recollected through Mr. Stevens' first-person perspective, this first-person narrative is quite different from those in other works. Kazuo Ishiguro employs an unreliable narration method. Unreliable narration intentionally uses narrators with limited perception and understanding, such as children, to observe and tell the story. This restricted perspective creates a subtle yet significant deviation between what the narrator recounts and the actual meaning perceived by readers, generating a profound aesthetic and emotional impact. In the remains of the day, the unreliable narration doesn't result from limitations in the narrator's observation or understanding. Instead, it stems from Mr. Stevens deliberately avoiding and evading when recalling. Mr. Stevens' narration and recollection often contain evasive and contradictory elements, most notably in the Jewish maid's incident. Initially, Mr. Stevens staunchly claimed that Lord Darlington had no inclination toward anti-Semitism. However, as the narrative progressed, Mr. Stevens inadvertently revealed the truth. Lord Darlington did hold a pro-German, anti-Jewish stance, leading to the dismissal of two Jewish maids from the estate. Mr. Stevens' contradictory statements stem from his reluctance to admit that his pursuit of becoming a great butler had long turned into a fantasy. The object of his service, Lord Darlington, was not as perfect and selfless as he wanted to believe. Once he acknowledged this, the meaning of his thirty-plus years of devoted work and even the significance of his entire life would be obliterated. Thus, his recollections alternated between certainty and hesitancy. In this blend of reality and illusion, truth and falsehood, Mr. Stevens found an anesthetic that temporarily allowed him to evade psychological trauma. Here, Kazuo Ishiguro's key theme of self-deception is depicted with exceptional precision. The remains of the day follows a typical diary structure. 
Mr. Stevens records his observations along the journey over six days, reflecting on his over 30-year career as a butler. His recollection of his professional life spans the sensitive period between the two world wars, impressing us with Kazuo Ishiguro's skill in laying out historical details and driving dramatic releases. Additionally, the character's language in the novel is highly intriguing, especially Mr. Stevens' choice of words. As a butler serving in an aristocratic household, whether speaking to others or engaging in internal monologue, Mr. Stevens' diction is extremely formal, meticulous, and cautious. While restrained and cautious language in conversations with the master can be attributed to professional norms, the use of the third-person father instead of you when directly communicating with his own father appears particularly cold and distant. As the remains of the day unfold, for the butler Mr. Stevens, it is a tale of dedicating a lifetime to a career, awakening to reflection only in his later years. For Britain, it marks the poignant passage of the once glorious and flourishing British Empire through the crucible of war, ultimately descending into decline. The entire novel is enveloped in a faint yet indelible melancholy, employing a serene tone to recreate the aristocratic past and echoes of the empire. It meticulously unravels the tragic fate of ordinary individuals beneath the canvas of grand history, unveiling the macrocosmic history with the microcosmic threads of sorrow. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.